No. No. no.
Good morning. Good to see all of you here. And Happy New Year to you as well. I know many of our folks are home sick with COVID or something else uh, and are joining us via our live stream. I'm thrilled that those of you who are able to be here in person have come. We have Kermit the Frog to what do we owe this great honor. It's a, it's a very exciting day. Um, my name is Pastor Julie Thompson Barrier. I think most of you know, but you may not know our seminary intern who is starting with us officially today, Annie Cantoha. Annie, say hello. So glad. Annie will be a regular with us now. She'll be leading worship with me most Sundays, and we'll be preaching occasionally. We'll be helping out in areas of worship and Christian education. And a little this, a little that. We're not sure. She's going to learn all of what it means to be a pastor while she's at her second year of uh, studies at Princeton Theological Seminary. So, Joe's going to Annie with us. She's also an ordained elder at the Madelon Presbyterian Church, so knows very much what it means to be part of a Presbyterian congregation. And her family's here as well, her, her mom and her daughter. Um, glad to have you as well. So, welcome, Annie. Today, we celebrate Epiphany. It is officially January 6th, after the 12 days of Christmas, uh, but we celebrate the Sunday closest or before, so that is today. And like Christmas, it is not only just a day, but an entire season. You will hear a little bit more about that during the message. Um, because of the, the holiday calendar, our office will be closed tomorrow in observance of, of New Year's on Saturday. Also need to let you know that uh, while the coronavirus cases are high, we're going to forego our fellowship time with, with coffee and goodies in the parlor. But especially on such a beautiful day as today, I encourage you to, to stick around and visit on the front porch if you'd like. Uh, in the nice balmy weather, uh, soon we hope to be back enjoying our, our regular um, fellowship time. And then next Sunday is another very special celebratory day. It's called Baptism of the Lord. It's when we remember Jesus being baptized by John in the Jordan River. And it's a day that we will be doing two very special things. First, we will be baptizing uh, older children and adults who have never been baptized and also want to make a recommitment of faith. I think we have 10 people we're going to have lined up here, two that are going to be joining the congregation. And we're also going to be ordaining and installing the elders and deacons that we elected in October. So I don't think there's much time for a sermon. I'll just say, God loves you all, and we'll do, well, maybe a little more than that. But, you know, it will be short because we'll have liturgy and other celebrations um, that will take precedence next week. I think that is all the announcements I have. Are there any other things to include? And I have forgotten. I know we're continuing to bring meals to the center, right? Bring your, your leftover meals. You can grab containers in the back uh, that we share with those in need. Um, and uh, continue to check the church website and email for other opportunities. Um, on communion Sundays, we have a child that usually leads us in our liturgy. She has COVID in her family. So I will take her place this morning and lead us in our call to worship. You would join me in the responses and bold. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord shines upon us. We are called out of our darkness into light. We rejoice in the gift of the light of Christ. Lift up your eyes and see the faithful gather together. Our hearts rejoice as we greet the Lord with praise. Come, let us worship the God of light and joy and peace. Stand.
needed. Please join me in the call to confession. The light of Christ shines in our lives, even in the dark corners of our lives. Let us seek God's forgiveness as we pray together. Eternal God, wondrous star, light no darkness can overcome. Drive out the sin in our hearts. Forgive us for resisting the life you would have us live. Refresh us and restore us. Focus us on the brilliant light of Jesus Christ, that we may see him more clearly and follow him more merely. Help us be people of the light, shining your light of righteousness, peace, and joy into all the dark places of our lives and world. As certain as the dawn follows the night, so is the promise of God's forgiveness and love. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the responsive passing the peace. Lift your eyes and look around. The light of the gate of Bethlehem shines from the face of each one here. Let us rejoice that we are here together and pass the peace of Christ. I invite the children to come down. Come on down, kids. You brought a friend. Hey, good to see you, Christina. A lot of our friends are here today. Oh, little change. That's okay. A lot of our friends are here today. Some people are feeling sick and they're staying home. And I have a new friend. Have you met my new friend? No. Her name is Annie. Can you all say hello to Annie? Hi. Annie is learning how to be a pastor. And while she's learning how to be a pastor, She's going to be with us on Sunday. So it's like having two pastors every Sunday. That's kind of fun. Do you think two pastors is better than one pastor? Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah. So here's something else. Do you think it's better to try to follow Jesus all by yourself? Or do you think it's better to have other people around? Other people around. Other people around. Yeah. You're not sure? Okay, so here's something I want to think about. Who do you notice that's up here on the table? Very careful. Kind of just fill it. Okay? Want to hold some video? Okay, and I want to. Okay, like you notice, I turned down the light. Okay. What if we hold our lights really far apart? This is from each other, like a baby goes over there. Does that give us much light? No. Now, what if we put our lights really close together? <gasps> a lot of light. What do you think about that? Did you notice that from over there? A lot of light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he also told us that we are like the light of the world and we should spread our light. So it's important to remember that we can't just be our light by ourselves as good as we can when we're together. Now I'll take this back so you don't hurt yourself. It feels very good on your hand. You know, why? Because light is warm, isn't it? Yeah, so warm. It, it, it feels like my hand looks getting a spa. Your hand is getting a spa. Well, I love that description. Yes, warm is like your hand getting a spa. Okay, so I want you all to take something to help you remember what it means to be the light of the world. I didn't bring one for Kermit. Should we give one for Kermit, too? Yes. Of course he is. I know him very well. All right. I'm going to give each of you a light, 
that you can take it home and maybe you could light it someday with a grown-up at home. So you don't have one yet, sorry. You get one later. Kermit and Adrian. There you go. And James. All right. To remember to shine your light, especially in times like this where people are feeling a little down and sad. Right? It's not quite as fun when there's not a big crowd of kids here. So we need to shine our light even brighter. Can we do that? Annie's going to help me do that. She's going to help me shine my light brighter, and I bet she'll do it for you too. Good news, huh? Can we have a prayer together? Oh, look, Adrian's already hand folded, ready to go. You can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. That he is the light of the world. And help us to shine our light. Help us to shine our light. Wherever we go. Wherever we go. Amen. Thank you guys for being such good listeners. And remember to take your light with you. All right, and you can come back for communion later in the service. Judy and I are 
longtime friend from my former church. It's a pleasure to be here. She's been here before, not a stranger to our congregation. Uh, both, we have uh, COVID cases in our music department, so they will, both Jeff and Jason hopefully will be recovering soon, but we're glad that Judy is able to uh, to pinch hit with very little notice. Thank you, Judy. You're a wonderful congregation. Hold <laughs> hands. <laughs> All right, this, our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. I invite you to follow along in your bulletin if you like. This is the reading we usually hear on Epiphany. Let us listen again for God's holy word. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child that has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On Friday, my husband John and I spent the day in New York City. I hadn't done that in a couple of years. At my request, we did many of the typical tourist activities taking in the sights of the department store windows, the shops and the ice skaters at Bryant Park and Rockefeller Center, a carriage ride through Central Park. We even caught the last few minutes of a mass at St. Catherine's Cathedral. And as we were heading back to Penn Station about 3 o'clock, the New Year's Eve of revelers were just starting to get into position to watch the ball drop. Three o'clock. That's something I feel like I never need to do in person. Although now I can say we were at Times Square on New Year's Eve. We both commented how remarkable it was that there were tens of thousands of people, although only 15 this year compared to the usual 60, thousands of people willing to stand outside for hours and hours in all kinds of discomfort, usually in much colder weather than we had on Friday to see some B-list performers and watch a brightly lit ball slide slowly down a pole. It's been happening for the last 113, 14, 15 years, I believe, since 1907. No offense. I would rather drive around and see Christmas lights. I would even pay money to go to the PNC Art Center and see those lights in front of my car. But my favorite thing to do is to light candles all around the house. Even got so excited to do it this morning on our communion table. 
I love the light of candles, the simplicity, the glow, the way it pierces the darkness. Too often we only do it when we have a power outage and go frantically searching for candles in the junk drawer. You all have a junk drawer, don't you? Right, okay, good. Light has always fascinated human beings in these darkest days of the year. Because early Christians associated Jesus with light, they celebrated his birth just after the winter solstice, as the days slowly start becoming longer again. For 12 days, Christians celebrate the light of Christ, from Christmas to Epiphany. So we're still in Christmas. In fact, I debated, do we include the Advent candles or not? Yes, we're still in this season of Christmas. As an adult, Jesus said about himself, I am the light of the world. The Nicene Creed calls him God of God, light from light. True God from true God. Begotten, not made. But this light of the world is more than the pretty lights on Christmas trees or in a store window or in a park. He is more like the sun that takes away the darkness of life. As Isaiah described this light as radiant and glorious. Well, humans have always been drawn to light because, practically speaking, the light helps us see where we are and, and where we're headed. And light also helps us to be seen. Some of you know I used to work at a running store, and when we used to have weekly group runs, and whenever the days would get shorter and the nights longer, we had a rule that you had to have a light to see and be seen. People say, oh, I'm fine running in the dark, I got a glow in the dark shirt. And you say, perhaps, but you need to see and be seen. Well, the same holds true for the light of Christ. It shows us where we are. It shows us where we are headed. But this light is something even more, both wonderful and frightening, in that the light of Christ shows us who we really are. It helps us to be seen to ourselves and to the world. Well, today is Epiphany Sunday. Maybe you didn't know it till you got here this morning, or maybe you read last week's email. Most of us probably arrived here this morning not really remembering what that day is about. It's something after Christmas. But in the early church, you may not know that Epiphany was actually more important than Christmas. That's the day when they exchanged presents. In fact, I think in, in the Orthodox Church, they still make a much bigger deal out of Epiphany than Christmas. Epiphany in Greek means to reveal or to shine. And it was the celebration of God's revelation of Christ to the world. That was the main event. And similar to Christmas being a season and not just a day, Epiphany is also a season and not just a day. So for the coming weeks, you'll hear in worship words about what it means to shine our light, especially in what seems like an increasingly dark world. We celebrate how God has been revealed to us in Christ and how we can shine the light of Christ in the world. And after this difficult year of 2021, which in many ways was more difficult than 2020, with its disruption and its division and its constant change and historic highs and lows, Perhaps you're having trouble seeing how God's light is shining in the world. And maybe you feel like your light is not shining too brightly recently. I think that's why I got so inspired to add some lights to our celebration this morning, besides the fact that I love candles, just to remind us that this is the beginning of a season of light. Maybe if I have enough candles, we can do this every Sunday with Epiphany. We'll, we'll say, stay tuned for that. Well, I don't need to remind you that this year we have endured all kinds of loss, all kinds of change, and many of us 
are eager to return to life that we were used to before this major disruption. Although I don't think we ever will. I think we are permanently changed as people and as a culture. I probably don't need to remind you that we are not the first ones to have such feelings of loss and grief and disruption and dislocation. Actually, in 2022, life with COVID is merely a minor inconvenience. Most of us still have all the comforts and rights that we are used to. But imagine what it might have felt like to live in 600 BCE, 600 years before the birth of Christ in Israel, when armies of neighboring countries came and took over the land of the people and kicked them out of their own country. Syrians took over the northern kingdom, the Babylonians took over the southern kingdom, known as Judah, captured its people, and took them away from their home as prisoners. They were sent into exile, banished. The land and the future that was promised to them, gone. All of a sudden, they have to learn a new language. They have to be used to a new culture where the people worship the sun and the moon and the king. Their bodies have to adjust to a new climate from hilly country to hot plains. It was like starting their lives over. Total newness everywhere they looked. Nothing familiar. And then 50 years later, we're talking about a generation later, it has been so long since life has felt normal, they feel like giving up. And they beg to go home. Can you imagine if we lived in a pandemic for 50 years? How many of us would make it up? Can't even imagine. But 50 years later, finally there was a priest named Ezra who convinced the king of Babylon to let these people go back home. And the king even gives them some money to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. The people of Israel are so excited to go back and pick up where they left off 50 years ago. They figured it would be just the same. But when they get back home, they find that nothing is the same. Nothing was the way it used to be. Their city is in ruins. It's been destroyed by war. And on top of that, their neighbors didn't really want them to come back. Talk about darkness and despair. We know nothing of that level. At this point, the people of Israel are sure that God has forgotten about them. Just then, the prophet Isaiah urges the people of Judah not to give up hope. He assures the people that God has not forgotten them or their city and promises them that everything will change for the better. They probably didn't believe it. Heard the words that Annie read from the prophet, where Isaiah challenges them to move out of the darkness into the light with these words. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Imagine how these words would have sounded to people who had completely lost hope. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And notice it's not an invitation, it's a command. Like anyone in the face of grief and tragedy, they probably can't even think about the next minute, let alone the next day or year or generation. Isaiah continues. They're probably still not exactly sure what in the world he's saying. He keeps going and says, and describes this joyful homecoming scene. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And then he gives them another command. Lift up your eyes and look around. And he tells them to envision the lost sons and daughters of the city returning home again. And says, God's light will shine through the darkness and they shall see and be radiant. Their hearts will thrill and rejoice 
Camel caravans will come from all over Asia bringing gold and frankincense. Sounds exactly like what we heard in the Gospel of Matthew. Gold representing wealth and royalty was the sign that Christ would be king. Frankincense, which was burned daily in the Jerusalem temple as a holy offering to God, was a sign that this child was holy. And myrrh, the bitter spice used to wrap the bodies of the dead, was a sign that even though he was royal, even though he was holy, that he would die. Very powerful gifts. The most important detail that the Bible does include about these wise men is that they are from the East. So besides the shepherds, the first people who come and acknowledge and worship Jesus, these visitors are, are not, not the Jewish king Herod. They're not the chief priests and scribes. They're foreigners, outsiders, not from around here, as they used to say a lot when we lived in the South. You guys aren't from around here, are you? They are Gentiles, which are non-Jews outside the bloodline. So compared to the Jews of Israel, these men looked differently, dressed differently, spoke differently, even ate differently. They had left the comforts of home, traveled long and far, crossing deserts and mountains and national barriers to honor this new king that they had heard about. They left what was familiar and risked to go to an unknown, unfamiliar place that they really didn't know anything about. They sacrificed and gave these extravagant gifts, not the gifts you typically bring to a baby shower. These gifts to a newborn king, and they gave of themselves, not knowing if there'd be anything that they would get in return. And actually, this doesn't say this directly, it probably took them two years. Would you go on a trip for two years to somewhere you've never been and bring an extravagant gift? I don't know that I would. And I bet they wondered a time or two if following a star for thousands of miles was such a good idea, if it was worth their time and their energy. They probably had days where they wondered, is this even true? Is this prophecy even real? But when these weary travelers arrived at the manger, they knelt down and worshipped him. That's what paying homage means. They knelt down and worshipped him. And in giving, they received. And they refocused their attention from then on on spreading the light of Christ on their journey back home. Well, how does this story that we've heard over and over and over, if you've grown up in the church, how does this story meet you in your life circumstances this year? Is God calling you to risk and travel to an unknown or an unfamiliar place? Is there something comfortable and familiar that maybe you need to leave? Is there a gift that you need to give that perhaps would be sacrificial on your part? One that can change the life of another person. Perhaps God is calling you to shine the light of Christ to a place you've never been before or somewhere that you don't want to go. And just like those wise men or magi, you may wonder a time or two if it's worth it. You may wonder if you're off course and will keep checking your map and your watch. And you may wonder if you've heard God correctly, or even at all. Well, friends, I believe that God has created us, and Jesus has redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit has anointed us to see God's glory in all things, and to shine with God's glory in all that we do. And God calls us to live with a sense of God's good light, to take wonder in the, the fields and floods and rocks, hills and plains, from one of my favorite carols, and repeat the sound in joy. To live at peace knowing that God is working out all things for good, and that God can bring good out of 
all sorts of evil. I believe this season of Epiphany is a great time for us to emerge from the darkness, to take our eyes off ourselves and our circumstances and our little world, and to look up, and to look around, and look for places of darkness where we can shine the light of Christ. The more we keep our eyes on ourselves, the smaller our world becomes. I believe Epiphany is a great time to let go of our obsessive need for comfort and safety and exercising our rights. And let the light of Christ shine in us and through us and show us who we really are. We are children of light. So go and be the light. Don't run from God, don't forget God, don't settle for being less than you really are. Christmas lights may be coming down today or soon, but not even Scrooge can extinguish the light of Christ that shows us where we are, where we are headed, and who we really are. This is just the beginning. So friends, you are children of light. So go now and be the light in a dark world. We move on now to our offering, which many of you know we are not passing the plate in, uh, since COVID began. We have our offering plate in the back of the sanctuary. You can place a gift there if you haven't already. We also have the ability to give online using our QR code there in the bulletin. And let us bring our gifts to honor the babe of Bethlehem and bring light to all the dark places in our community. Accept these gifts of money and time, indeed the gift of our very selves. 
Let them shine for all to see and be brought into your love. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We have come asking for the Christ child, wondering where that love might be born, seeking the joy that might satisfy our thirst, wandering through the darkness of so many mistakes. There is something here at this table that will satisfy our hunger. No matter how long we have wandered, here our hearts arise. Our light has come. It is with this expectation that we come to this table to taste and see that God is here. In this bread and this cup, we celebrate a mystery that we can't quite understand. God satisfies our hunger in the most unlikely way. God comes to be with us, Emmanuel, now and always. Let us join in the great Thanksgiving prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for making your love evident since the very beginning of time when you spoke the word which replaced the darkness of chaos with life-giving light, a light which has nurtured generations of people and plants and creatures great and small, a light which also revealed the fear and powerlessness caused by so much evil. When you spoke the word which would once and for all dispel the darkness of chaotic lives, for your love for the world, the Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. And angels carol glory to you in the highest heavens and peace to all people on earth. Holy God, as the travelers with their treasures were overwhelmed with joy on finding Jesus, so we also are overwhelmed on finding out the depth of his love for us. For Jesus showed just how beloved we are to him by loving us and giving himself for us. O oh God, send the power of your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and unfermented wine that we may experience the presence of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Breathe your Spirit in us that we may be one body with him, living out his ministry in the world today and every day. And now we join in the prayer that he first taught his disciples to say, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On that night that Jesus gave himself up for us, as he sat at the table, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat of this, all of you. This is my body given for you. Remember me every time you do this. And after they had eaten, he took the cup he said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this cup, remember me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us feed on them in our hearts by faith. If you have not already received an individual's portion, it looks like you have thrown it the body of Christ broken for you and blood of Christ.
please join me in prayer? We give you thanks and praise, O oh God, that you have fed us with your mercy and poured out your spirit in this place. Continue to nourish and fill us each day that we may live as your beloved people in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for our final hymn. Uh, what star is this? Is that right? No.